and welcome to How to Fix It. Avengers Endgame came out last week, and I haven't seen it yet. I'm not really caught up on the MCU. I skipped the first two Thor movies, Ant-Man and the Wasp, haven't gotten around to Doctor Strange or Guardians 2 yet. I didn't watch Infinity War, and I haven't seen Captain Marvel, so, uh... Yeah, I've got some catching up to do. However, because Avengers is a pretty big thing this week, and it'll hopefully bolster the view counts a bit, I wanted to talk about one of the movies. And it just so happens that one of the four Avengers movies is a tad polarizing, at least based on how many think pieces I've seen about it. When I first saw Age of Ultron, I enjoyed the hell out of it. But I also saw it the day of release, and I haven't seen it since. So there might have been some big flaws that I was overlooking because I was in, like, the state of ecstasy from the new movie. Or maybe it really is good, and the backlash against it is like the backlash on every Star Wars movie that's come out since Empire. Totally blown out of proportion because of a vocal minority. Return of the Jedi is a masterpiece, don't at me. Plus, this week is actually four years to the week that Age of Ultron premiered in theaters, and that was totally unintentional, and I'd be stupid not to use the opportunity. So let's see if Age of Ultron aged well, and if it didn't, how it might have been improved. The film centers around the Avengers, made up of Iron Man, Captain America, Thor, Hulk, Black Widow, and Hawkeye, Okay, come on, that one's not even original. Couldn't have at least sprung for Last of the Mohicans? In the midst of an assault on Baron Strucker's castle, in the wake of S.H.I.E.L.D.'s takeover by Hydra because Strucker is now in possession of Loki's staff, and given that the last time Loki's staff was used, it was used to open up a giant portal that allowed aliens to almost destroy New York, it's imperative that Thor take it back to Asgard and toss it in the vault. But Strucker isn't stupid, and he knows that he's outmaxed, deciding to erase all his computers and escape, not wanting a secret project to be known yet, which was seen at the end of Winter Soldier, the secret project being the Twins. The Twins are Pietro and Wanda Maximoff, aka Quicksilver and the Scarlet Witch, who are voluntarily working with Hydra and stop... We have to stop for a minute. So, because of all the various rights issues, these characters don't have the same parentage that they have in the comics, but in the comics, Pietro and Wanda are the children of X-Men villain Magneto, who was a Holocaust survivor. And if you can't figure out why it's totally unacceptable to make the children of a Holocaust survivor willingly work with the Marvel Universe's stand-in for Nazis... You've got bigger problems that I do not have the time to go into here. Their justification for it is that they hate Tony Stark because his weapons got their parents killed during a military attack, but I still hate it. However, despite half the team getting whammied by Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver, they manage to win, and Iron Man recovers the staff, but not before Scarlet Witch gets to use her powers on him to induce fear, brought on by his PTSD from the first movie, and possibly foreshadowing the events of Infinity War. The team returns victorious, though Hawkeye got hit pretty badly. However, they have good medical treatment, so he'll be fine. They head back to Avengers Tower, and Tony gets Bruce so they can study Loki's staff since it contains awesome power, and they find an artificial intelligence inside more powerful than Jarvis, deciding to use it to create a global protection program that they nickname Ultron. Which, if you ask me, is just asking for it to turn evil and try to murder humanity. Seriously, in fiction, evil AI are always named something that in hindsight, it's like, yeah, no shit they turned evil. HAL 9000, Control, Brother Eye, they just sound evil. Anyway, once Hawkeye is fixed up by Dr. Cho using advanced technology, and because evidently their job is finished, they decide to throw a huge party. The party dies down hours later while Ultron gains sapience and murders Jarvis, before turning Iron Man's workshop on to construct himself a body. He confronts the Avengers, explaining that in order to save the Earth, he has to eradicate humanity. Of course! But they make short work of his first shambling body, although Ultron manages to flee through the internet to Strucker's base and uses the robotics there to construct a more permanent body, along with several backups because robot consciousness. Sort of speaks to how low they are on manpower without S.H.I.E.L.D., because that place should have been cleaned up hours before the party started. 
Ultron teams up with Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch to kill Strucker in prison before going to Africa to obtain vibranium from Claw. And I gotta give them props for introducing Claw in 2015, given that Black Panther wouldn't come out until 2018. Three years before the character was relevant and he's already hanging around. Ultron kicks their asses, again, and Scarlet Witch whammies the team with visions, giving each member she hits, Cap, Black Widow, and Thor, different but equally unsettling visions. Cap sees the horrors of World War II and the vision of Peggy Carter, Black Widow sees her past, training in the Red Room, and forced sterilization, and Thor sees the destruction of Rasgard, potentially foreshadowing Ragnarok. The Hulk is also whammied, but we never see his vision. All we see is Hulk rampaging through Africa, forcing Tony to use the Hulkbuster armor to take Hulk down, with massive collateral damage and casualties incurred. This forces the team, along with Ultron's continued existence, to flee the Hawkeye's safe house, where it's revealed that he has a secret wife and kids. I'll go more into that later, and Thor departs to check on his vision with the help of Dr. Selvig, one of his minor supporting cast that I know nothing about because I skipped the first two Thor movies. Movies. Banner and Black Widow discuss their apparent relationship and bond over their mutual lack of ability to have kids. Then, Fury arrives at the safe house to talk the team into becoming a team again, while Ultron forces Dr. Cho to use the vibranium along with her advanced machines that can create synthetic skin to create a more permanent and nigh-destructible body for him. While the body cooks with the power of Loki's scepter, the Mind Stone baking inside, Thor sees visions of the Infinity Stones. Scarlet Witch also reads Ultron's mind through the new body, and upon discovering that he wants to destroy all humanity, the Maximoffs turn on him and decide to help the Avengers. The Avengers, plus Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch, attempt to steal Ultron's new body before his mind uploads to it, while Tony investigates the mysterious force that's been stopping Ultron from just taking over our smart device unnecessarily internet-connected culture, which turns out to be Jarvis, who remains slightly active after his destruction. The team manages to confiscate Ultron's new body, but at the cost of Black Widow, who Ultron abducts. Tony manages to finish the body, believing it to be their salvation, since he replaced Ultron's consciousness with Jarvis, but Cap and the Maximoffs attempt to stop him, given that the last time he tried to give an AI power to save the world, Ultron happened, destroying the power source. Thor arrives, and having been spurred on by his vision, powers up the device with Mjolnir and creates Vision, who is on the side of kicking Ultron's ass. Black Widow sends a signal to the team, and Fury pulls whatever resources he has from S.H.I.E.L.D. out of mothballs, so they can mount an assault on Sokovia. Having lost his body, Ultron decides to use the rest of the Vibranium to construct a device that will raise Sokovia out of the ground, fly it into the sky, and then drop it back down, essentially creating a localized extinction-level impact. The Avengers shield, including Fury and Maria Hill and Brody, attempt to prevent Ultron from activating it and evacuate the citizens, but when Quicksilver covers Hawkeye, he is riddled with bullets and dies, causing Scarlet Witch to go after Ultron solo. The city raises up, but Tony and Thor manage to stop it from hitting the Earth, and the day is saved. In the aftermath, Hulk is trapped on a Quinjet and vanishes into the ether, eventually hitting a wormhole that sends him into Thor Ragnarok, and Vision locates Ultron's final body and destroys it. Thor departs to Asgard to investigate the Infinity Stones. Hawkeye retires to his family because... I don't know, they needed a reason that he wouldn't already be around for the Sokovia Accords and Civil War. Tony goes home and Steve remains behind at the new Avengers base with Black Widow to train the B-Team, Falcon, Scarlet Witch, Vision, and War Machine. And because people will get mad at me for not mentioning it, in the mid credit scene, Thanos retrieves the Infinity Gauntlet and says that he'll do it himself. <laughs> It's an Avengers movie, so there are some things that are just always awesome. The fight scenes, for one, are amazing, and the cinematography is very well done. The good thing about having a team rather than, say, one solo hero, is that the fight scenes are always diverse and have different styles, as opposed to how naturally Iron Man uses his repulsors in every fight, and Cap always tosses the shield. We get a good balance of all the fighting styles, and especially after he spent the last movie brainwashed, I like how Hawkeye gets to shine a bit. Not a lot, but more than he did in the first movie. 
Say, now that the original MCU is done, can we get a Clint Kate Bishop Hawkeye movie? I especially like the final battle. Reminds me a lot of those Star Trek Online TFOs, where the player and a team have to defend a target against a swarm. And while they're a tad boring to play over and over for 14 days to gain a prize, they're pretty awesome to look at. There's not a lot of character development apart from the usual team building stuff because their real development comes in the solo movies, since juggling the huge cast doesn't leave room for a lot of individual stuff, but I'm happy that, since apparently they haven't figured out how to make a good Hulk movie yet, that they've developed some anti-Hulk measures like the armor and the sun's getting real low stuff in between films. I like that they have a method to calm the Hulk down since otherwise having him as a team member is really dangerous. Some people disliked it, but it also led to one of the funniest moments during the gladiator fight in Ragnarok, so I dig it. Plus, we get some nice moments of quiet reflection instead of just rapid-fire action for the entire film, which I enjoyed. And the acting is awesome. All the actors play their parts well. Danny Jr., Evans, Hemsworth, Ruffalo, Johansson, and Renner are great. Really, anyone who recurred from the first movie is great, and they were born to play their roles. And the newcomers, Olsen, Spader, Taylor Johnson, are also great and did a good job. Spader especially, given that it was a voice role, but Ultron felt truly real. Not entirely what I think Ultron should sound like, but for what he was given, he did it exceptionally. And the story isn't entirely bad. There's some stupid, but that's to be expected in every superhero movie that's ever existed. I like the premise of the Ultron thing, and come on, Ultron goes evil because he sees how humanity is destroying the planet? That's the most believable rogue AI I've ever seen. Not because of predictive algorithms or an error in programming or that they want to deactivate him. Thing just saw how shitty humanity is and decided to nuke the place. How many times have you seen a meme where they say the human race is cancelled? I see a lot of them, and Ultron being an outside observer, it makes sense that he'd go to the extreme. I also did like introducing Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver since they were a part of the team in the comics, and I like accuracy and adaptation, though I feel like not enough was done with Quicksilver to make his death meaningful. I felt bad because the Scarlet Witch felt bad, not because I cared about Quicksilver. Though, given how the Flash has gone, it makes sense to off him because otherwise he'd have to be nerfed during Civil War to explain why whichever side he chose wouldn't immediately win because Speedster. Vision is pretty cool too, and while his backstory is different than the one I know, the one I know is the one from the 1999 animated series where his mind is based off of Wonder Man's, he's introduced well and making him Jarvis makes us care about him since we spent years with Jarvis before this. I also like how Thor's Vision Quest also introduces the concept of the Infinity Stones in such a way that it lets the cosmic stuff be started, but it isn't super overt until we see Thanos at the end with the gauntlet. The music is predictably awesome, and while I love Alan Silvestri, this one is a collaboration between Brian Tyler, who hasn't done anything mind-blowing that I've seen, and Danny Elfman, who always turns out a good score for superhero properties. And like I said, it's damn impressive that they did half the legwork for Black Panther years before Black Panther started filming, giving us lip service to Wakanda, and introducing Claw, who frankly does nothing of note here, but is integral to T'Challa and Killmonger's story in Black Panther. And the effects are top-notch as well. I like their version of Ultron's design, and while it's not entirely faithful to the comics, I've seen worse redesigns of iconic villains. It ain't perfect, but at least when you look at him, you get the Ultron vibe. The humor is pretty decent as well. It's not like in, say, Batman v Superman, where Lex is just laughing maniacally or making piss jokes. The humor fits the situations that it's necessary for. And while I think that the party was premature, given the fact that they can't be so stupid to assume the Avengers were going to split up because Hydra's reeling, it's totally within Tony's character to throw a party, and the scene where they try to pick up Mjolnir is awesome. Still think that Steve sensed that he could lift it, but chose not to as to save face. A lot of people complain about the quipping during fights, but look, I'm a Ted Cord Blue Beetle fan, and he's the master of banter, so it's never bothered me. And overall, the movie was enjoyable, and I didn't find myself bored or wanting to watch one of the solo movies during it, so that's a plus.
first off, I mentioned it before, but it bears repeating here. Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch willingly worked with Nazis. I have nothing else to say on the subject. On to the less heinous stuff, I found the forced romance between Black Widow and the Hulk to be extremely forced and bizarre. Like, there wasn't any build-up, and it just sort of happened in this movie. She clearly had something with Hawkeye in the previous film, so why wasn't it a romance? I'm the first person to advocate for platonic relationships, but why didn't the platonic relationship go to Bruce and Natasha? Why did they not put Hawkeye and Black Widow together? They did every other comics couple except them. Just to give the Hulk a girlfriend? Was Liv Tyler not available? It's really contrived, and they have absolutely nothing in common, and they don't try to give them anything in common other than they suddenly like each other. The most we get is Black Widow asking Fury at the end if he knew that they'd end up together, and Fury giving a non-answer. When did the director of S.H.I.E.L.D. become a Yenta? And what the hell is up with Hawkeye's secret family? Out of all the Avengers to have a secret family, Hawkeye? Could they not think of anything interesting to do with him? Was this to make up for the fact that he was barely developed in the first film? Because if so, it totally and utterly failed. And I really like Linda Cardellini, so to make me not want her in the movie, that's how bad a decision that was. And Black Widow considers herself a monster, different from the others like the Hulk. Because she can't have kids? Like some nasty-ass patriarchal bullshit. Please, Doctor Who was able to do that with dignity because at the very least, the reason that Amy considered it a bad thing that she was unable to have a child after River was because she thought Rory wanted children and she wanted Rory to be happy. Not that she was a monster. If the graduation ceremony was like having to murder a baby, then I can see herself considering herself a monster, but infertility? Not monstrous in the slightest. You can kind of see how you can tell that a straight dude wrote the movie. This also leads into my problem with what they do with Bruce Banner and the Hulk, which is absolutely nothing but the forced romantic arc. Sure, he feels bad about the collateral damage, but that's par for the coarse Hulk stuff. Nothing new. I also think it was sort of a cop-out to basically end the Hydra arc so soon after Winter Soldier shook up the status quo. It's like making a giant game-changing move in the comics, only to have the entire universe reboot the following year. So, actually, if they were trying to stay faithful to the comics industry, that was actually the right call. I'm sure they did some work with it in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., which I don't watch, but to only have the opening of the film focus on the fallout is a letdown. Having the fight against instead of alongside S.H.I.E.L.D. might have been interesting, and it was an absolute misstep to kill Baron Strucker so soon after his introduction and have Ultron supersede him by murder. They gave a huge push to Zemo in Civil War, so to not show the same respect to another comics Hydra alum wasn't a good choice. On the subject of the villains, James Spader is great as Ultron, but the trailers promised a creepy, evil AI, and we got a sarcastic robot. That makes sense, since it's basically Tony Stark's kid and Tony is sarcastic, but they promised us HAL 9000, and they gave us lore, so it was a letdown. I mean, look at the DVD cover. Ultron's all looking to the side, all mysterious and evil-looking, and the way he is in the movie is more like... Hi, Christopher. I'm Nero. To me, all the infighting brought on by Scarlet Witch's visions feels like an attempt to ape the first movie and the infighting that Fury had to use Coulson's trading cards to quell. It's almost like Joss Whedon didn't have any other ideas other than Avengers 1, and they forced him to do Avengers 2, so he just changed a few things in the script. People got real mad about Star Wars The Force Awakens cribbing A New Hope, which I felt was totally justified because this was reintroducing Star Wars to the mainstream after a decade, and Avengers Age of Ultron felt way more cookie cutter, and feels like they just had a list of things that people liked about the first one that they put into the second one. Infighting. Check. Easy win at the start that leads to the main villain's plans going into motion. Check, it's basically the same movie. And even if some elements are admittedly better, like Hawkeye, it just feels like a pale imitation. And that was a real nice anti-collateral damage speech that Steve gave, but it's sort of undercut by every movie released 
after this one. Especially Civil War, where the collateral damage caused by this movie is a key plot point to every arc in that film. It's like how every season on The Flash, Barry says that he won't kill, but most of the villains end up suffering a fate worse than death. Finally, and this might be a bit blasphemous and might be a little obvious based on my previous comments, but I think Joss Whedon is overrated. This is at the end here because it wasn't really a detriment, but I also admit that I don't have the unwavering fandom that some people had to look past its flaws. I'm being objective as a general Marvel moviegoer can be. Alright, here's how my ideal version of Age of Ultron would go down. The beginning stays mostly the same, except that we don't get any hinting about Bruce and Natasha, and they reveal that Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver are being blackmailed or taken captive or something, like Bucky, or, and then that's why they're working for Hydra, because there's no way to make them working with Nazis work. Furthermore, don't kill Strucker, and instead, have him be the right hand to Ultron, and maybe have Ultron kill him near the climax, since Strucker is crazy and evil, but he wants Hydra to rule the world, not wipe out humanity. So Strucker gets to be the humanized, sarcastically evil one, and Ultron gets to be HAL 9000. And that also makes it so that the Hydra arc won't be on its last legs here, since Strucker will be around longer. And if they really want... ...in fighting due to pressure from a dwindling fan base, ...then they can have it, and absolutely have it be a result of Tony creating Ultron without any input from the rest of the team. Have the movie express to the audience how Tony always chooses what he thinks is best, which would provide a perfect lead-in to the Sokovia Accords, where he makes his decision based on Alfre Woodard's character and not consulting with the team. Plus, it would sort of make Captain America's position a lot more uh, powerful because the entire Sokovia thing was Tony's fault in the first place, and so now we're just gonna listen to him again to fix it? And I guess Hawkeye can still have his secret family, but honestly, I'd rather that he just be in a relationship with Black Widow, and maybe give us an inverse of the Wally West Artemis dynamic from Young Justice, where Clint wants to retire, but Nat wants to keep avenging, and they're forced apart, at least until Civil War, where he returns to help his friends. Plus, him fighting against Black Widow would pack a bigger punch if they were at one point an item. And then we need to make Quicksilver matter. Apart from Wanda feeling the hurt, why do we care? Maybe if they turn good earlier, maybe Strucker loses control of them during the Vibranium scene, and they decide to help the Avengers right then and there, and Scarlet Witch tries to reverse the whammy on Hulk with Quicksilver helping her, so we get more time with them as good guys, and we'll see Quicksilver do something humanizing. Really, from there, the rest of the movie was really good. Ultron tries to make a new body, the heroes turn that body into Vision, Ultron tries to destroy Sokovia by dropping it onto the Earth, Bada bing bada boom, Hulk goes into space because of a very small part of Bruce, after witnessing the destruction that Hulk caused in Africa, sets the Quinjet to take him somewhere deep into space where he can't hurt anyone, inadvertently ending up in Ragnarok, we get a lead-in for the Infinity Stones, and we get a lead-in for Thanos. Not hugely different, but ultimately I think it's a better and tighter film than we got. And that was Avengers Age of Ultron, a misguided film that wasn't entirely bad, and with a few small tweaks may not have been so maligned by fans. Of course, most of that could have been staved off by not making the Romani Jewish character side with the Nazis. But it was an easy fix, because Marvel did know what they were doing, and the film served its purpose to be a link in the long chain that eventually wound up leading to Endgame. I just think that it could have been a better written stop on the way there. Next week, actually I'm taking the next two weeks off, but I'll be back after that with a new video. See you next time.